I live in a um, small rural community, about 500 people. Everybody knows everybody. I'm um, from Blackfeet Nation, uh, Métis, and I am um, HIV positive. I was working in a second level lodging home um, in Hamilton and it didn't feel good. And so I asked my boss, like, I don't feel well, I need to go get checked out. So she told me to go to the hospital. And I did. And about maybe two weeks after that, I get a phone call to bring somebody in. And uh, the doctor says, uh, you have HIV, you have AIDS, which she said, not HIV. She said, you have AIDS and um, you need to get your uh, business, your affairs in order. I had a partner at that time and um, I wanted to tell him that uh, I was di just diagnosed um, HIV. But what happened was my uh, boss called him up and said, um, get checked out because uh, Donnie's got AIDS, you know, and uh, it was rough. It was, it was really rough. There are all sorts of reasons why people with HIV uh, might not want to disclose their status. For example, if you live in a small community and you disclose your status to one person, that person is under no obligation to keep that confidential. Uh, small communities, I grew up in a town of a thousand people, you tell one person, everybody in town knows every bit of your business the next day, right? And so there are reasons why people with HIV might not want everybody in town to know their status, you know, because that may lead to questions, well, how did you get it, right? Where did you get it from? It may mean real discrimination. You can lose your job, uh, you can be shunned by people. And if nobody will speak to you, if your family throws you out, um, all of those kinds of things that happen, those are really serious consequences for people. What I found out was like I just wanted to die and um, I want to run away. I didn't want to talk to people. I isolated myself and um, reaching out to my family to love me and uh, because I had this. And it was like every time I went there, I felt like I got beaten up. Emotionally, you know, I'd go to the house and uh, my dad wouldn't let me eat at the dinner table with them, use the utensils. He didn't know. And uh, he just thought I could catch it by sitting on furniture and I had to sit on a, a towel on the furniture. And um, it was rough. Didn't have anybody I can turn to about being positive. 
Tom was the first man I ever kissed. I was 37 years old, and uh, I figured out that I was too spirited. And we've been together ever since. And we raised my two children. I've been fighting the marginalization of being native, the marginalization of being gay. So I've had to fight my way back to uh, equal footing, right? Both internally, right, and externally. You either got to start eating back the stigma that's around you so you have a space to live in, or you'll drown in it. I knew people that had HIV and I didn't want anything to do with them. I think I shunned them. So now uh, all of a sudden here we are two, three years later and now I'm HIV positive. And you know, now I know what it feels like. So it's about a year now that I've been positive and don't really know how it happened, but me and my partner uh, are co-infected with that. There's people that don't know they have it until they are checked. So that's where we fit in. We went to check for diabetes and everything and decided to get the HIV check and that's where we caught it. The doctor had called us in and she sat us down and she looked at us and we were both sitting there and she goes, uh, you have some bad news for you. You've both been tested for uh, positive for HIV. And it was just kind of like uh, my jaw dropped and I was just like, all right, are you, are you right, are you sure? I talked to my nurse and then she told me you can live with it now and uh, it's not a death sentence anymore, Donna. And she told me that like I'd be going on these pills but first I would have to straighten out my life. And we're gonna be taking these for the rest of our lives now. This is the antiretroviral therapy. Early on when we were first diagnosed, my HIV antibodies in my body were up to 170,000. And since taking this uh, ART antiretroviral therapy, uh, my numbers are down to zero. I found that I was positive. Uh, September 20th of uh, 1996, I believe it's a Friday. I was involved in the HIV and AIDS movement um, in so many ways that I knew all the services and I got told on a Friday when everything closed and so um, it was a, something that I was needing to um, sit with. Um, thought that I would deal with it in a much healthier way when I tested positive, but I really kind of let myself go off the rails for a few months. I have things that you would think you'd find in a hospital in my house. It makes the difference between being able to have a somewhat normal life or being in a situation that is completely dehumanizing. The idea then becomes, okay, if I'm seeing somebody, do I let them see that I have all of these things that are a part of my life in order to keep my life normal? So people living with HIV in Canada there's no obligation to disclose your status generally. You can normally keep that information private and disclose it if you choose to, to friends, to neighbors, family, employers, that kind of thing. Where the law steps in is specifically with respect to sexual partners. You are required to talk about your status to a sexual partner if what you were engaging in might constitute significant risk of transmission. And significant risk had been left um, kind of open uh, by a Supreme Court decision that had happened back uh, in 1998. Uh, they seem to indicate that if you used a condom, if you took uh, safe sex precautions uh, to protect yourself and your partner, then there was not significant risk and therefore disclosure wouldn't be necessary. 
What happened in 2012 with this new Supreme Court decision was they upped the ante. Before it seemed like using a condom, practicing safer sex was some sort of a defense for those people who for one reason or another um, were reluctant to reveal their status. Today in Canada, a person living with HIV who was going to have vaginal sex with a partner would need to disclose their status before having sex to that partner unless two things were in place. Both condoms were being used and the person living with HIV has a low or undetectable viral load. If those two things aren't in place, there would be an obligation to disclose the status before having sex, otherwise you could be charged with aggravated sexual assault. It's, it's a very severe punishment, it's aggravated sexual assault that people are being charged with, which means um, up to 25 years in jail, as well as registering as a sex offender. Um, so this is, this is kind of the weight um, of the law that's, that's being talked about in the Supreme Court ruling. We're using the law of aggravated sexual assault. So that's the law you would normally use for a violent rape um, or, or a sexual assault where a weapon is used, where someone is, is severely injured. So why does that apply to an HIV non-disclosure case? A case where you know there's no transmission of HIV and when the test is set out in terms such as significant risk and realistic possibility, it doesn't set clear guidelines. People don't know exactly what that's going to mean in their everyday realistic lives. You have to be able to prove you have an undetectable or a very low viral load, so you're not really infectious. And you also have to use a condom. Now, people seem to think, well, that should be okay, right? For somebody like me, uh, a man living in Toronto, I can, I can meet those criteria. I can go into my doctor's office, it's a 20 minute bicycle uh, ride away, and get a viral load test every three months. If you're living in a small community in the north, for example, you don't have access to viral load testing on a regular basis. You may have to get on a plane and fly to the next city and you know, meet your doctor. If that happens once a year, maybe you're lucky, right? So people who don't live in big cities suddenly since the onus of proof is on us to prove that we have an undetectable viral load, suddenly find themselves unable to prove that. Even if they do have one, they can't prove it and therefore they're vulnerable to prosecution. This court case decision puts women in particular uh, at significant risk themselves because if they're in a vulnerable situation, so if they're in a situation where there's abuse, or if they're in a situation around trying to ensure some sort of uh, uh, housing for the night because they may be on the street and they may be struggling, um, even identifying or disclosing that they're HIV positive uh, could put them at physical risk just because they're HIV. And then you still have the complexity that it's the other individual who has to wear the condom. A woman isn't always able to enforce condom use. She can't necessarily make sure her, her partner uses condoms. And unfortunately, it's a reality in our society that many women can't control the circumstances under which they have sex, who they have sex with, when you know, sexual violence remains rampant in our societies and violence against women. The court has now given more power to abusers um, or people who are in uh, not healthy relationships with people living with HIV to hang over their head and say this is this is another way that I have control and power over you and this is something that I can do. I can go to the cops now um, and charge you with aggravated sexual assault. Anybody with HIV, the more vulnerable they are, the more difficult, the higher the risks are for them to disclose. And so, of course, for those people, um, it becomes, it's much more dangerous. They're more likely to be charged. It seems to me that this Supreme Court decision really produces a division among those of us living with HIV, and it's going to impact on the most vulnerable people far more than it's going to uh, impact on, on people like me. I want to stop this, and it's epidemic, and I, I really truly want to help. It's going to be taking the lives of a lot of young people, if we don't start addressing this now and trying to do some about it. So that's where I'm at right now, is uh, trying to make an impact and share my journey and, you know, be a role model. We knew people would treat us differently and we 
you know, get ostracized and treated like that. But we thought the benefits of helping our youth would outweigh that. So we decided to come publicly and to do workshops, educational workshops and sharing our journey. Had we not went and checked ourselves that day, there are people right now walking around that don't even know they have HIV. And you know where it's spreading? Amongst First Nations, big time, and in Saskatoon with the youth. Overall, what's the benefit of a law? What are you trying to do with a law? And you're trying to improve public, the public good. You're trying to either make things safer or better. Um, and I think if you kind of analyze this, just saying, does this help the public good? Um, in general, criminalization does not help the public good because it will basically deter people from getting test, testing and treatment. There's an assumption that this law will increase HIV prevention and, and help prevent transmission. But if you look at it, really there's little reason to believe that and no evidence that that will happen. The threat of these harsh criminal charges could be just one more reason that people are reluctant to get tested for HIV, are reluctant to talk openly with healthcare providers, with harm reduction workers, with HIV counselors who could actually help them uh, reduce their risk behaviors. So in terms of HIV prevention, it's likely to have a counterproductive um, impact on many people. Many of my patients who live in primarily Aboriginal communities still are very, very affected by stigma from the community and um, it does impair their care sometimes and I actually have had a number of cases where someone has known about their infection but not wanted to seek care for it as long as they felt okay because they didn't want the risk of having to go for medical appointments, of having you know medical documentation going back to the local doctor's office, because they were aware that if that got out in the community, um, that they would essentially be shunned, or at least treated very differently. The the criminalization it makes people go in hiding. It stops people from getting tested. A lot of our young people are um, fearful um, for gossip in our community. Um, so there need to be a safe place for them to go where they can talk with other people who are positive. What we do with the person, with the participants, or anybody who comes here, like even if it's yourself and you just want to chill out, what we get you to do is start here and talk, this is a place of what I feel. I feel angry, I feel love, I feel joy. We get the person to actually what I do, what I think, what I say, what I feel. And when they go through the processes, we get them to name it. So once they name it, then we can give them the new languaging. I'm on my way to the Canadian Aboriginal AIDS Network, AGM and Gathering, and I'm flying from Edmonton to Toronto to uh, go and participate. I went away, got healthy, and came home with a drive to be involved with CAN from the very get-go. So I believe it was like 2004, I've try to attend at least one can event every year. I find it's a great place for me to stay um, aware and informed because even as much as we know about HIV and AIDS, there have been some constant changes. Prosecuting people with HIV sends a message to the public that uh, people with HIV are some somebody, some, someone to be feared, right? And I think that that message is amplified in terms of the coverage uh, in the media of these kinds of cases. The media is portraying a person living with HIV as a criminal, as irresponsible, um, as a sexual predator, then that's what the public comes to understand about people living with HIV. This notion of HIV monster and HIV vampire, I mean, those are terms that I pulled from newspaper headlines. And so when you begin to associate HIV with monsters and vampires, I mean, of course that frightens people. 
we don't very often see stories about the majority of people living with HIV who are responsible and are trying to protect their sexual partners and are happy, productive people. I think in terms of the law, if an individual was maliciously and intentfully subjecting people to harm, uh, whether that be through HIV or any other means, could be charged. So I think there's laws in place that can do that. Uh, and I think singling out HIV and the transmission and the significant risk doesn't do us any good. UN AIDS came out with a report. They had experts from around the world that looked at this question of uh, criminalization of HIV. They feel that uh, the harm caused by prosecutions is uh, so great that they feel that there should be no prosecutions unless it can be shown that somebody has uh, intentionally or really negligently actually passed on HIV to other people. And if Canada followed that advice, um, we wouldn't have these cases that we have now. Many of them don't involve uh, transmission at all, and in many cases, uh, people were not trying to kill anybody, right? They were, you know, they made, maybe made a stupid mistake. I worry about what it's like for other people to disclose still. The disclosure issue is very much the same human feeling to me. As an HIV positive person, what are my thoughts on this case when I didn't even have any background on the facts? I don't actually know that that necessarily protects us from intimate partner disclosure. If we're not passing the torch uh, for youth, Aboriginal youth who are living with HIV to join our movement. If people know you're HIV positive, you hit the slippery slope into marginalized populations. The, uh, the Extra magazine here. In the 90s, the front page just used to be death notices. Uh, that's how many people died, right? There was, uh, it was every day, another one or two or three people died. Two thousand and five, and there's probably not twenty names on it, right? For deaths, whereas two thousand and twelve, we we have five names. We're in the tenth month, right? So I mean, the <clears throat> the medication's keeping us alive, but what quality of life do we have with the stigma and marginalization we're forced to exist around? HIV's taught me what love is, HIV's taught me what hate is, and HIV's taught me how to love myself, right? So, it's a double-edged sword, right? It either kills you or makes you the greatest human being you're ever gonna be. The Supreme Court ruled in October of 2012, so it will be a good number of years before this issue goes before the Supreme Court again. But just because charges could be laid in certain circumstances doesn't mean they have to be laid. So I think what we have to look to now is talking to the ministries of, of the Attorney General in each province, as well as Crown prosecutors, to help them understand the science of HIV. Making sure that um People who have generally acted responsibly uh, don't get dragged off to jail is another important part of our, uh, of our strategy and making sure that court decisions are based on up-to-date scientific information is kind of a key, uh, a, a key part of that strategy. There's still a lot of fear and the fear is based in mostly either misinformation or old information. And so because it's a rapidly changing area, I just think the world hasn't caught up with the new reality and that the key to addressing that is really the information and examples. 
If you're engaged in a relationship, the responsibility isn't just on the person living with HIV, it's on both people. We need that equality and that respect between partners and that level of education and kind of self-responsibility. Um, and you know that has to come from many different angles, but it's certainly not going to come from the courts and from judges and lawyers. If we're going to be crafting solutions to any problem, we have to be talking to people who are most affected by it. And they need to be leading and driving and centered um, in terms of conversations that are happening. When you're first diagnosed with HIV, you're given a book, Managing Your Health. And that section has different alternative ways to treat this HIV. One of them is Native American culture. And in there it says, this could be a sign from the Creator for you to reevaluate your life. This is your last chance. We have to, you know, really grow up and get real with ourselves in order to live a good lifestyle where we can stay away from the drugs and alcohol and the other bad influences and concentrate on our life and our medications and heal in our minds and our hearts. Our journey is still going ahead and I can see us doing, you know, being who we were meant to be and uh, being happier. We forgave each other and that was another step to take in our relationship was that forgiveness and just to know that there's somebody beside you all the time that totally understands how you feel and and then on those rough days they're like right there just like, hey, brighten up. <laughs> I'm here, it's okay. <laughs> The HIV has given me the power to be a voice for the ones that can't speak and don't know how to speak. It's like you really know what I'm going through, you know my pain, and how did you do that? And so by them asking me how, gives me permission to say my story. There's a face to the disease. So as long as there's a face, then I can go out and help educate our people and say, you know, this is Don, this is me. Um, yeah, I'm afraid, I'm still afraid. But if I can't change who I am and let people see the authentic me, I break the stigma right there. In recognizing individuals who have been involved in our movement for a long time, as the Lifetime Legacy speaks to, I am truly honored to be able to present an award to David Nelson. People don't have a lot of places, I guess, to talk, even after this many years. And I'm grateful that I get to have such personal moments with people, that people share things with me that they're not even willing to tell their family members. One of the things I can do as part of being who I am is if I'm the guy who goes in and is so comfortable and open about it, maybe that reduces the stigma for somebody else further down the way. I don't think I'm going to fix everything in my journey, but I know that I'm doing things that are hopefully going to make the steps a little softer for somebody else that comes after me to walk.